I'm going to talk fast because I've got 10 minutes, and she told me I'm getting the hook after 9 minutes and 59 seconds. So I do work for Workforce Solutions. It's the regional workforce board for the Valley, uh, for the Hidalgo Wilson Star Counties. I'm the director of their business services department, so I get to spend all my time out with the business community. I'm all, I've also been the executive director of the South Texas Manufacturers Association for about for 10 years or so longer than I work for workforce. Um, I'm going to kind of get over here. This is a quick slice of the economy based on the number of jobs in the valley. I'm going to give you a little overview of the economy of the valley and talk a, talk a little bit about some technology and that sort of thing. But uh, the engine of our economic growth is our 3% birth rate. In the rest of the country, the population is growing at a 1% rate, which means it's barely we're barely creating enough new humans to replace the ones that are dying. In the valley and along the border region, our population growth rate is 3%. So that's one reason a lot of companies are looking at the border for as places to go to, to find people. We're also a, a net exporter of young talent coming out of universities and schools. But if you think about what an economy would need, if, if the engine is people, what would the economy need to grow? What kind of growth would that trigger? And obviously um, what people need is health care. So 27% of our workforce is in health care. Uh, you need government services, fortunately or unfortunately, that's primarily public education, law enforcement, and the various other government public sector jobs. Then you need stores, places to buy stuff, so you got retail and wholesale trade, that's another 21%. And then the fourth largest one is called leisure and hospitality, but that includes all the hotels, restaurants, places to eat and all that. So if you put those four together, that's uh, over 80%. That's about 80% of all the people in the Rio Grande Valley work in one of those four sectors. The bad news is they don't pay very well. So if you're, worried, if you're wondering where the most jobs are, that's where the, the least amount of skill is needed to get those jobs. These are, these are the average weekly wages. It's not based on hourly rates. So like in oil and gas over here, the average weekly wages are way up because People tend to work long hours in the, in the energy sector. But leisure and hospitality and retail, you can see here, have the lowest pay. Typically entry-level jobs. A lot of college students will work you know, while they go to school. Health care surprises a lot of people that it's a lot lower than manufacturing and some of the other ones. And that's because health care has average wages of over $1,000 a week when you look at doctors, tech people, high-end you know, licensed medical practitioners, and so on. But over 50% of the workforce in healthcare is home health, social services, providers that make $8 an hour, and a lot of people working in that home health sector that, that drag the average wages down. <clears throat> I won't spend a lot of time on this. This is the same trend you'll see nationally. These are the goods producing jobs in the valley, defined as construction, oil and gas energy, and uh, manufacturing. And these are the service jobs, everything else. You can see that goods producing employment has stayed flat and it's grown like a rocket all through all the other service sector jobs. And the nation looks the same way. So you hear a lot about the, that we're becoming a service economy. And that's normal evolution, I'd say. I won't spend a lot of time. This is a real, real busy graph, but this just shows the employment in each sector in 2004 and the employment in 2014. You can see healthcare went from 65,000 jobs to almost 100,000. And this is just uh, Hidalgo County and Cameron County combined. Then there's, there's your government, law enforcement, edu public education, teachers. And then there's your retail, leisure and hospitality. These are your goods producing sectors. It's hard to tell here, but transportation, warehousing, and ut utilities has doubled in the same time that manufacturing employment has pretty well cut in half. You think about our proximity to Mexico and the maquila industry and all that, it drives a lot of logistics, warehousing and all of that, transportation. But uh, it's, it's also a competitor with lower wages for manufacturing jobs. So some of the trends and you're going to wave at me when I have five minutes? OK. Oh, OK. Um, some of the trends and opportunities, there's a, there's a lot, but a few I thought I'd mention. Aerospace is, is a big one on our radar screen now. SpaceX has gotten a lot of attention because it's uh, going to Brownsville, they're going to be doing some final assembly of their rockets because they're too big to bring down a whole rocket on any kind of vehicle. They have like 12 giant engines on one rocket. So they're going to be doing some final assembly um, and they're going to be doing launching. One, one launch a month, uh, 
you know, 12 a year starting in 2017, I believe it is. Uh, but most people don't know we've also got United Launch Alliance that's been quietly building rockets in Harlingen for over 25 years. They build uh, payloads that go up uh, on United Launch Alliance rockets to release satellites into space. They build the whole payload section in Harlingen and some other sections as well. Here in McAllen, in the McAllen area, we have GE Aviation with over 500 employees that refurbishes jet engine blades on GE jet engines. The important thing about SpaceX, it's actually only going to create 170 direct jobs. You'd think from the discussions that it's going to be thousands. But the multiplier is, like other manufacturing, it creates a lot of other related jobs because of their presence here. And the big thing to me is that now that SpaceX has selected the valley, economic development corporations around the valley are getting a lot of interest from some pretty major players in the aerospace sector who all of a sudden are looking at South Texas as a, as a possible site. One of the fun things I get to do in my job is work with economic development corporations around the valley and sit at the table with a lot of their confidential prospects that are looking at the region and provide labor market information. So I can't talk about them, but, but it's fun. Um, the energy sector, everyone's talked a lot about that. We know the prices are really low right now. There's been some layoffs. But with the Eagle Ford Shell north of here, um, the Burgos Basin and other shale plays have been discovered in Mexico um, that are about five times bigger than the Eagle Ford Shell. Right now, with the price of oil being down and all the cartel security issues and all that, I don't think we're going to see a stampede of development in the Burgos Basin in Mexico. But we already have a lot of interest from the Port of Corpus, the Port of Brownsville. There's a lot of interest in uh, using the valley as a place to stage pipe and sand and stuff like that, that that's going to go down into the Burgos Basin. There's also a, a huge offshore oil field that Mexico, Pemex owns, that's, that's already getting interest in development. So you can say what you want about fracking, you know, whether it causes earthquakes or you're adding to global warming or whatever, but the reality is fracking is actually disruptive technology. In the past, I won't get into a lot of details, but drilling before was build a well somewhere over what you think is a a pool of oil way down on the hard rock and keep drilling and hope you hit a, a little cavity where the natural pressure will push the oil, the oil up. They've known that oil and natural gas existed in shale, porous shell rock for years, but it's porous rock and there's no seams in it, there's no cavities. So this one company, I think it was Mitchell Petroleum or Mitchell Energy, the guy worked for 15 years to develop technology, first of all to drill down and turn 90 degrees and drill sideways, and secondly, to, with pressure, mostly water and 1% chemicals, fracture open the shell rock and create a cavity so that the oil and gas could come out. And that's what fracking is all about. And there's been all kinds of uh, process improvements and new technology in the, in the hydraulic fracturing industry that, that are dramatically lowering costs and all that. So I guess the, the compromise on that is that natural gas is uh, much less harmful to the environment than oil. <clears throat> and natural gas is used to generate electricity, which means we're very competitive for manufacturing companies. We're able to attract some manufacturing over here instead of Mexico because the energy cost and the cost of electricity is uh, lower than the co uh, offset some of the cost of labor in Mexico. You all know about UTRGV in the medical school. That's going to create opportunities to um, add some more jobs on the high end of that healthcare sector. I won't talk too much about produce. We know that we know that um, the Maslana Durango Highway, which is built across the Sierra Madres in, in southern Mexico, is going to allow produce that right now goes up to Nogales, Arizona, and then all the way back across the U.S. can come straight to Laredo in the valley, knocking two days of 750 miles off the trip. So we're seeing a lot of investment in produce, and there's actually a lot of technology going on in the produce sector, irradiation to, to treat the... Uh, to treat the produce, a lot of uh, process improvements going on there. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys have already figured out STEM and technologies where to be. But um, so I tried to think about entrepreneurship a little bit, and I'm sure y'all have heard all this before. But obviously, you got to be solving a problem. You, you need to find a need that hadn't been met. You can do goods or services. Do your homework. Maybe maybe you want to work in some field you're interested in, and then come up with the big idea or get some experience so you, you're, with, your, with your education maybe you're better prepared to, uh, to launch your own business. 
you've already heard this, I think, because you've done 3D printing, but 3D printing is your best friend if you're inventing or designing new products because now you can get it done at a low cost. And then I'm just throwing this out there in case that person is out in the audience. If you want to change the world, find an alternative to the internal combustion engine. And in my opinion, it's not going to be electric cars. There's something far more dramatic than that out there that's going to change life as we know it. I guess that was it. Um, one thing on technology. A lot of people talk about manufacturing job loss in the country. We had 17 million manufacturing jobs in the United States 15 years ago. Now we have 12. I would point out that that's still 12 million jobs. And this, I didn't have this on my presentation. But this is the recession, this gray line right here. The blue line is manufacturing output in the United States. The red line is manufacturing employment. So you can see that in 2003, from 2003 to 2007, output per worker was increasing dramatically fast, faster because the number of workers wasn't growing at all. So output per worker was increasing dramatically. When the recession hit, of course, everything collapsed. But look how those lines have widened since the recession. The blue line is output. The red line is manufacturing employment. So the bottom line is the employment has gone down about 11 percent, but the output of manufactured products has gone up 11 percent. So what's going on there? It's technology. Technology, companies have invested in technology instead of people. Robots, automation, process improvements, lean manufacturing, all those things have increased the productivity of workers. So a lot of the job loss in manufacturing is not the jobs went to China, it's the strong back, no skilled jobs in manufacturing are disappearing, like in a lot of other industries. One other thing I'll show you real quick before she gives me the hook. This was, this was a statewide analysis that Texas Workforce Commission did, and I'll, I'll just tell you what it means. But in 2012, 85% of the people looking for work in the state of Texas were look, did not have an associate's degree. They had less than an associate's degree of education. And scraping all the, on, all the job postings, online, work in Texas, newspapers, and all that, about 56% uh, of the jobs could be filled with less than an associate degree. So that means 85% of the people were chasing 55% of the jobs, and 15% of the people were chasing 43% of the jobs. So if any of you have had economics, there's a scarcity of supply here, right? Excessive demand, what happens? Wages go up. Why would anybody raise wages for entry-level jobs when you've got so many people that, that can fill them? So my belief is that on a macro level, this is one of the reasons for the, the widening wage gap in the United States. So if you're doing science, engineering, technology, math, uh, getting an education, deferring personal gratification by going to school longer, doing the hard work that needs to be done, you're going to be rewarded. And there's so many people my age going out of the workforce in every single sector. In my opinion, it doesn't matter what field you want to go into. If it's a, if it's a high skilled position, if there's science, technology, engineering, and math involved, there's going to be room for you in it. I better go. That's, that's it for me. Thank you. Oh, okay. I want to open up the floor for any questions that you all might have. So you can just raise your hands and, and we'll take on you. <laughs> okay. So uh, I haven't followed this as close as I should, but uh, the uh, uh, highway across the mountains from Mexico's west coast had opened like a year and a half ago, right? Actually, no. So they're, call they're calling it open. It was supposed to. So could you give a little bit more details there about uh, why we haven't seen this kind of predicted explosion in, in produce? Well, the last I heard is it's still not really open. There's a lot of detours that have to be made. It's still not considered. Um, it's still not considered efficient and and quick because it's there's still sections that are under construction and delays and detours and all of that. That's what I've been told by people in the produce business. So, so my assumption is it's it's not ready yet. We are seeing an increase in produce, but nothing like we expected. But the the companies, a lot of companies that are based in Nogales, Arizona, have set up uh, businesses or relocated businesses here. So. To me, the industry has made a decision to move here. It wasn't anybody in the government or some smart person telling them that 
they can do the math, 750 miles off a road trip with fresh refrigerated produce in, in a tractor trailer is, is two days. And uh, we just don't know if it's going to be 35% of the business going through Nogales or 70%. That's driving a lot of concern about the capacity for commercial traffic on our bridges. I'm sorry, we had some more? Yes, sir. What type of jobs does your organization uh, focus in on? Mostly, is it mostly manufacturing jobs or? No, we're, I mean, we're, we're the regional workforce board, so we have a, a working state, there's a statewide job matching database called workintexas.com, and anybody can go to www.workintexas.com. You can browse job openings here or anywhere in the state. You can create a job search application for yourself, say what you're interested in, what your minimum starting wage is, what zip code you'll work in. You can even look for jobs in Austin from here in workintexas.com. So what we do locally is we service the businesses who have created job postings in our area and even some businesses out of the area that are recruiting here if, they, if they're from Texas. And you'll excuse me if I, if I missed this at the very beginning, but do you, do you find uh, IT jobs here locally? That, and, and if you do... Um, I didn't have time to get into the details, but one of the challenges we have here is there aren't a lot of high-paying good jobs open and it's really hard for people with no experience to get into them so we see a lot of a lot of big companies are coming down here and recruiting folks such as yourself i know at tstc they have some technology programs and toyota and raytheon and bell helicopter come down here and get their applicants every year so again we're we're one of the few places in the regions in the country that that is creating a lot of people and a lot of talent so economic development, the challenge is, you know, the economic, ec economic development people would like for us to educate all of y'all and then tell someone to just put a wall around the valley and not let anybody leave because we've invested the money in you, right? But, but you can't say you're for free enterprise and then talk like that. So for me, I think our people should go wherever they can go to get a job. You can make 30 to 40 percent more money in Houston, Dallas, or San Antonio for the same mid-level blue-collar type job. I've looked at those myself. Um, 35, 40 percent more money there than you can here, and the cost of living is about 5 percent higher. So you don't have to be an economist for young people to figure out that, you know, maybe I need to go north. So the challenge is, you know, we need to increase our education rates, you know, graduate more people with high skills so that we can recruit companies here. And it's, a, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. We can't create a bunch of skilled people and have them sit home on the couch while the EDCs try to recruit a big, sexy company. But, you know, hopefully we can get people back when the opportunity comes. Yeah, I'm, I'm here in the Valley for six years only, and I really don't understand why the manufacturing sector is not growing, was not growing in the last year because it's, it's almost nothing. Uh, your presentation is very good, it's very focused, and what is your experience? What do you think about why we don't have enough manufacturing uh, companies here in the Valley? Well, what, what's happened is we've gone from a few big manufacturing companies like the apparel industry, that I, I was a plant manager in the apparel industry for years. Now, the la any kind of labor-intensive operation, and I've met with lots of relocation prospects who looked at both, say, McAllen and Reynosa or, or, or somewhere in the valley, and we can't compete with $5 yeah, a day. I, I, I agree. <laughs> so with, with, a, with a labor intensive operation, uh, the plans will be go to Mexico. So the strategy now, though, here's the strategy. Uh, since, since the recession and with all the cartel violence and all that, most of the foreign direct investment in manufacturing has skipped the border. You haven't seen much maquila growth. They, they fill back up. You know, they brought the employees back that were laid off, and the plants are full, but no, hardly anyone's building new plants in Reynosa, Nuevo Laredo, Matamoros. All the direct investment has been down in the interior. But most of these companies along the border and in Mexico, they're, most of their manufacturing in North America is now in Mexico. So they're pressuring their suppliers, who are not labor-intensive, to go to Mexico. Well, most of them don't want to go to Mexico because, because of the security issues. So the EDCs all along the valley are, are, have a lot of prospects from companies who are suppliers. And, and that's, to me, that's our sweet spot. They're capital intensive. Uh, they use a lot of electricity. We have, with, with fracking and low natural gas prices, we're competitive. And that, that's, that's, 
the EDCs that are concentrating on manufacturing are targeting suppliers, component manufacturers. One, one sector that is in this position is the plastic industry. Sure. I was last week in the, in the show uh, here in the United States, and they explain us that this, the plastic industry is the third most important manufacturing sector in the United States. And it's not intensive labor. No. And uh, as you said, it's a high capital intensive. Right. And they're long term investments. If you look from really uh, historically from Baton Rouge, New Orleans, all the way down to Beaumont, Port Arthur, there's a huge petrochemical. There's been huge petrochemical investments that are going on, and they don't even worry about the price of oil. Those are 10, 15, 20 year projects. And there's been there's some in Corpus and Gregory Portland and Corpus now, and there's some prospects along Corpus and Brownsville also in in that arena. So, yeah, there's an opportunity. I had one more question. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, big companies taking interest in the valley, and you mentioned people leaving. So if we were to actually get more attention from the giant corporate companies to create, I guess, a, a reason for people to stay here. What it cost for the economy of the valley to grow and turn into something similar to San Antonio or Houston? I mean, those <clears throat> those things take time. I mean, our population is growing. Certainly, the, the the challenge is to keep the economy diversified. Right? Many, many, many years ago, we were just agriculture, and then we got pretty heavily dependent on manufacturing when the garment industry came here, and then they disappeared, you know, in in, in a two-year period. And now, but the the economy in the valley is pretty well diversified. I mean. It's going to be service-based, but we do have manufacturing, construction still suffering because the housing hasn't recovered. Mining is huge north of here, and it's going to be huge south of here, so we're right in the sweet spot there. So we're sort of like Laredo in that logistics and, and warehousing, transportation are, are going to continue to grow. And we're working hard to recruit manufacturing companies to the area, but most manufacturers have less than fit now that come here have less than 50 employees maybe a hundred after five years. So there's a lot of them, but they don't have a lot of employees each, and they don't have the resources a lot of the big Fortune 500 companies do to, to, to train people and create internship opportunities for students and all that. So it, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things where you just have to keep working on. And what you all can do is you know, talk up STEM careers and, and all of that. You can't go wrong. So uh, I probably shouldn't ask this question, but I'm going to. <laughs> so, uh, with your presentation, you've talked a lot about uh, what the EDCs uh, are doing uh, around the valley. And we've had this perception ever since I got here 18 years ago that the Valley Savior is going to be recruiting companies from somewhere else uh, who are going to leave and come down here. There's been very little uh, commitment on the part of EDCs and city, liter city leaders and others uh, to actually develop companies here and grow them. Uh, you know, we've got an entrepreneurship program, but I don't have Keith Patridge or, or anybody else uh, uh, banging on the doors of President Bailey saying we need to grow uh, our entrepreneurship program and the things we want to do to actually grow companies here. And I think it's a tremendous oversight, this idea that we have some savior that's going to come and, and uh, make things better for us. You know, that's yeah. the power. Yeah, I was on the McAllen Chamber Board for about four years, and, and, and uh, Steve Alanius is a big proponent of, of, of that. And I agree. I mean, there are fewer and fewer relocation opportunities you know a lot of the plants that we're going to leave up north have left right so you got a you got hundreds and hundreds of communities chasing a handful of possible prospects i mean we got some things going for us like i can say it now because the the mayor let it slip a couple years ago but we were negotiating with harley davison to build to move to close a harley plant in pennsylvania and open it in south texas and uh, they ended up getting such a sweetheart deal from the governor and from their unions and all that, that they stayed there. That was probably the closest we came. Everyone knows we've been on the short list to several auto, auto assembly plants in the last 10 years. But I think, I mean, the odds of that happening or of getting a huge operation like that are, are probably pretty low. And, and I, I think the emphasis is changing to recruit uh, component manufacturers and also on, it, on entrepreneurship. That's the component manufacturers. Great. You know, we got an example over here of, uh, you know, we've got this <coughs> critical mass of people who've been doing Makila stuff for 20 years. Mm -hmm. That it was a little bit of encouraging financing and help getting the contract uh, could grow from uh, a single entrepreneur or, or an entrepreneurial team uh, to, to real companies. And then there's 
not right. that emphasized. We're still waiting for you know this great relocation to solve our problems. Yeah, I mean there's some good stories out. There's some good stories out there like Fiber Rio and all that, but I don't have I don't have time to go into it. But sir, I agree with you completely. Uh, more jobs are cre are going to be created by startups and, and existing companies growing than by you know, the, the the holy grail of some major new company moving down here. We can still attract a lot of companies, but it's like having a diversified economy. You, you can't you got to have a diversified economic development strategy too. Okay, my time's up. Thank you. All righty, thank you, Mr. Willis. Everyone, give him a round of applause.